is the, the first two layers. Well, that's only 50% because we have four layers in total. Um, mm. The first layer is the, the very preliminary painting on the, the, the fresh plaster of the church. And uh, I've shown you this cross here belongs to that uh, phase. Uh, we know that there are more remains of this, uh, this earlier uh, layer elsewhere, but of course it's not spectacular enough to start separating paintings. In principle, we don't separate layers of painting from each other unless it is really necessary for the preservation. So the fact that we have removed the painting of the Dormition here is due to the fact that otherwise it would have perished. It would have either collapsed or the painting underneath would have to be sacrificed to the preservation of the Dormition. So in, in such cases, um, <coughs> you, the, you take the decision of separating paintings, but not for the main purpose of curiosity. There is a so-called Venice chart, and that is a, a sort of international agreement between restorers on what to do, what not to do. And in this Venice chart, it is uh, written that taking paintings from their context is uh, allowed only in the case that no other way of preserving the painting um, is, is, uh, is there. So that means that in this case, in the case of the other semi-dome, the painting underneath will probably have to wait for a while. Uh, we know that there is a painting underneath, and there should be a very fine 8th century and caustic painting underneath the 13th century painting. Um, my guess is that it, repen it represents a painting of Pentecost, um, but uh, we will simply uh, keep it there for the, uh, for the time being, simply because it's well, this painting is, is well fixed in its, uh, in its place now. Um, you will clean that one. This, it, it will be cleaned, yes, because this one has not been treated at all, so it is, uh, it is quite uh, darkened by, by, by soot and dust and so on, but it, it will have to be cleaned, certainly. In the 8th century, the, the painting stopped at the lower zones of the church, the nave and the gurus, uh, and you see that here around the, the arches, there is just a decorative pattern uh, of which you can see the traces here. By the way, we would like to complete the pattern uh, one day because it is a, a repetitive pattern which can be easily uh, reconstructed. Uh, two peacocks on either side of, of the arch, uh, two crosses here. And these are the very simple decorations that, that belong uh, to the, uh, the first paintings on, on, on the second layer. Um, in the, the times of Moses of Nisbis, this church was remodeled. Um, that means that the original apse, which I'm sure must have been there, was replaced by a square sanctuary with a dome on top. So originally what we had here was a tree coach, very much comparable to the construction in Sohag, for instance, where mm -hmm. we also have Red Monastery. The Red Monastery, yes. The only difference here is that the altar was not located here, as in Soha. Here we had a hulus with um, uh, a haikal over there. Whereas in Soha, the, the, the altar is, 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 was located, or is located under the, no, was located under the, the central dome. Uh, that gives it a, a slightly different layout in the practical sense of, for, the, for the liturgy. Uh, but otherwise, there is no reason to presume why there should not have been an apse here in the east. And as I told you, uh, my speculation is that the apse contains uh, an 8th century painting of the Ascension uh, of Christ. Um, in the 10th century, uh, Moses replaced, had this, 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 this sanctuary replaced by the present structure. And later on, you can have a look one by one uh, and admire the, the stucco work uh, inside the, uh, the Heikal, which is extraordinary for Egyptian standards. Uh, simply because um, this kind of stucco work is so un-Egyptian. Um, it was really done by craftsmen uh, brought here from Syria, the same way that the Mosque of Ibn Tulum was decorated by Syrian craftsmen from uh, the neighborhood of Samarra, and it's not unlikely that also the work here was done by people from Samarra. As you can see here on the, the, on the outside, it has, has close similarities to the, the Samaran uh, work. Um, there is just one, but it's hardly, hardly visible here in the, uh, the squinches or in these areas of the dome. There 
there are some traces of, um, uh, of paintings of four cherubim who are supporting uh, the dome, very much like the cherubim in uh, the church of Benjamin in That's the only painting that we have in the, in the high Hegelhout. Um, here in the Gurus, there was a considerable addition to the iconographical program of the, the church. And unfortunately, very little of it is, uh, has preserved, has been preserved, but still enough to, 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 to make it an interesting story, I think. Um, the dome itself, we still have to investigate further, but there's little hope that we will find anything there. Of course, um, it's understandable. The, the dome will have uh, had more problems with humidity, but the occasional rain will penetrate through the masonry finally. So uh, that is probably the reason why so little has survived of the paintings in the dome. In the lower zones of the dome, we have very small fragments of painting. Um, interesting enough, there is one painting here which no doubt represented the three men in the fiery furnace from the book of Daniel. Why in the dome, I don't know, but that's the only fragment here that we could identify. And then there was a Coptic inscription, and that's interesting because if we have a period of Moses of Nisibis and we have a Coptic inscription, it means that Coptic was still in use in the In other words, the Syrians did not have the monopoly here. And although it's, it's the, 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 the inscription is very fragmentary, but it, uh, it mentions uh, that work was done in the church uh, by Moses and Aaron. And it's interesting to see that we have Moses and Aaron as, as two names. Uh, and they were respectively the Igumenos and the Oikonomos of the monastery. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's very probable, it can't hardly be otherwise that this Moses is Moses of Nisbis, who was the Igumenos of the, the, the monastery uh, at that time. Um, probably it was still before he commissioned the, the new uh, Heikon. Because here you can see three windows which were what? Later. Now if the Heikon would have been there already, these windows might have been blocked already then. But what you can see here is that they were still open when these paintings were commissioned. In other words, uh, these paintings should be before 913. It's here. That's the inscription which is on the doors, uh, which marks the, 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 the reconsecration of the new Haika. But they were ice picked. I mean, they were painted yes. over. Yes, that's the usual procedure if, if paintings are covered with a new layer of plaster. You know, they, they are hammered with uh, to, to make the next layer of plaster fit. Uh, that's all fixed wrong. Better. Yeah. Um, there's a very interesting and unusual iconographical program in the paintings up there. <coughs> and that's also why it took us, uh, in some cases, so long to, to find the correct interpretation of paintings. Um, here, up there, there is no problem. There is a man sitting on a chariot, holding a book in his hand, and there is another one who's lifting his hand in his direction. And over there, there is another fragment with an inscription. And that makes it very clear that what we have here is the, the conversion of the, the Chamberlain of the Kandase, uh, Kandaki as she is called here in Coptic, the Queen of Ethiopia, you know, the, 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 the eunuch of the, the Ethiopian court who came to Jerusalem, who was on his way back from pilgrimage with a scroll of Josiah in his hand, and Philip uh, who meets him on the way and who you know, engages in a discussion converts him and finally baptizes him. So this story is related here. We see the, the Chamberlain unit on his chariot and here must have been a baptism because what we have is just the feet in the water here and there a piece of a bare back and it says uh, the eunuch in Coptic. So it's unusual to have this story depicted, but anyway, it was related here. Below there, we have a less usual story. <laughs> and it took me some time to, 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 to interpret that. We see a man with gray hair who is speaking to a group of men with dog heads. 
And dog heads do occur in Coptic iconography every now and then, in the legend of St. Mercurius, for instance, who, whose father is eaten by, by dog headed cannibals. This is uh, depicted in St. Anthony's Monastery, for instance. Uh, in the Coptic Museum, there is an icon yes, there. Yes, of the, the, the two dog headed cannibals who were converted later to, they became uh, good Christians. And, and So my first idea was, ah, oh, wait a minute, I've, I've seen these dog heads before, maybe they belong to the story of St. Mercurius, but that didn't fit in here. And it was difficult because here there is no inscription surviving, just one R. Well, mm -hmm. one letter R is too little to say something with certainty. Mm -hmm. The same man who is represented here with the wild grey hair is represented here while he is again baptizing her. Three men. So we have two scenes of baptism, one over the other. And this man is the same, but these people who are being baptized don't have dog heads. So initially I didn't link these, these, uh, these, these stories together. And then I started searching and searching and searching. Um, what was my... Ah, the next discovery I made was um, a Syrian book, no, a Syrian book of the Sea of Pentecost. And in the Sea of Pentecost, you see uh, the apostles sitting together, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit on their head in the, in, the, in the form of a flame. And then below them, in the lower zone of the illustration, were personifications of all the tribes of the world who were going to be converted. And you would see a black man, and you would see something with a very strange head on, on, on. And there was also one person with a dog head. Mm. It was also, ah, oh, wait a minute, so the dog heads are also belonging to all the tribes, all the strange tribes of the world who have to be converted. So maybe I can find more representations of Pentecost where the dog heads are occurring. And then I came to uh, a wall painting in Cappadocia, in Turkey, uh, with a scene of uh, Pentecost, Christ sending all the apostles, and all the apostles sitting in a row. And the nice thing was that each apostle was holding a paper in his hand with his name and his destination, as if he had a ticket for his, <laughs> for his journey. And so it was uh, St. Mark, of course, to uh, Alexandria, Thomas to India, and Andreas, St. Andrew, and Kinokefalia, St. Andrew to the land of the Dogheads. So I said, ah, so St. Andrew is the man who converted the Dogheads. I didn't know. And then I suddenly realized that this man here has very wild gray hair. You know, it's not nicely combed hair, it is really wild and gray. And if you look in the, if, if you go to the Coptic Museum in the apse uh, from uh, Arit, you know, this famous big, uh, you see the apostles standing uh, around the Virgin who is sitting in the center. And St. Andrew has the same wild hair. Also in Ravenna and in St. Catherine's Watch, everywhere in 6th, 7th century iconography, Andrew is represented with wild, uncombed hair. So I thought, well, then this might be St. Andrew. So I started looking in <coughs> apocryphal literature. And yes, bingo. There was the, acts, the apocryphal acts of St. Andrew, who was sent to the Egyptian oasis, so probably the region of Dakla or Farafra or somewhere else, and over there he found dog head cannibals. First they invited him for dinner, that means not to join them but to have him for dinner, <laughs> before being in fact eating. He managed to convert them, he baptized them, and he built a church, and of course, you know, this is the, the success story of the conversion of the dog head cannibals. But then I still didn't understand what is represented here because I thought, yes, but these are not dog headed people that he is baptized. And then, by sheer coincidence, I found an article of a colleague of mine, um, uh, Sebastian Brock, who is one of the great experts in Syriac literature, who wrote an article about uh, a poem by attributed Ephraim the Syrian in which he describes the story of Andrew. And in this uh, poem of, of Ephraim the Syrian, 
it is described how the dog-headed cannibals during their baptism undergo a metamorphosis, so they are transformed into sons of the light, as it's called. Mm -hmm. now, the term the sons of light is, is the term for decent civilized people. It means that they lose their dog heads and they are transformed into normal human mm -hmm. beings. And this is interesting because it means that this element of the transformation of the dog headed cannibals, which is absent in the literal story, which is, uh, has survived happily in the last but it does occur in the Syrian version by the Syrian. It means that one of the stories the, 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 the Syrian is the source for the painter here. And that, of course, is understandable if you realize that this was done in uh, the early 10th century on the Muslim Then we have another interesting point here. Between two windows, there is very little preserved, but enough to identify it. Here we have a representation of Alkar, king of Egesta. And you can find the, the, the pictures of the, the paintings in the book that you have know, received. And opposite him, between the other two windows, is a story of the conversion of Emperor Constantine the Great. Uh, that's written underneath the image in Syria. That is written in very clear Syria. The king, when he saw the cross, never believed. So it's the vision of Constantine at the moment. He has the vision of the cross appearing in the sky. He's sitting on this horse. But this is the, the moment before the battle against the exceptions. The, the moment of the conversion of Constantine. Upper is represented with the Mandilion in the sky. This is the story uh, which is told for the first time uh, by Eusebius of Caesarea in the 4th uh, century. But later on, it has been repeated several times. King Akbar of Edessa, who suffered from a disease, who sends his messenger to Christ, and Christ sends him back the message. He says, well, I'm sorry, I cannot come to you because the journey to Edessa is too long, but you will be cured of your disease, and I'm sending you my portrait. So Christ takes his uh, cloth, which he presses on his face. His face is, uh, by a miracle, uh, Pressed on the cloth, and this so called Mandilion, the cloth of Edessa, has been uh, the most important relic of the town of Edessa until the 12th century when it was brought to Constantinople, where it was where it disappeared after the destruction of Constantinople by the Crusaders. But the, the, the story of the Mandilion of Edessa is one of the most important uh, stories about relics of Christ in Christian world. But <coughs> by putting Upper and Constantine next to each other again. The Syrians apparently wanted to show, look, Constantine was the first Roman emperor who became Christian, but 300 years earlier, we had the king in the desert who became Christian. So, who became Christian. In other words, they propagate here, uh, let's say, the fact that they, as the Syrians, had the first Christian king in, in history. So it's very much of, of, of political uh, message. Um, on the other side, we have not finished yet, uh, but here is almost nothing, almost nothing. Just one inscription of name, and that's interesting enough. It says, Gregory Piagmani. Gregorius the Armenian. A lot about, about Mani in the <laughs> modern sense of the world. Words. It is Gregory Illuminator, and he is the, the person who has converted the Armenians to Christianity. So, what we have here in this upper zone of the church are all stories of conversions. The conversion of the Ethiopian, the conversion of the pagans in the Egyptian oasis the conversion of Abkar and the conversion of the Armenians. And there may have been an, another scene here, or there is still something there, but that's still, uh, still hidden. Um, why? Why this theme? It's, it, it, that's, well, these conversions have to do with Pentecost, because Pentecost is the moment that Christ sends his apostles to all the corners of the world. And to my opinion, it supports the idea that under this painting, there is a painting of Pentecost, and that the, 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 the conversions up there are a sort of next um, phase uh, following the, the, the theme of Pentecost in the southern 
half done. But there's something else. Um, the, the, the conversion of the world starts in Jerusalem. That's why the apostles are gathered at Pentecost. And from there, they go to all corners of the world, east, west, north, south. The, the sanctuary of the church is considered as uh, a symbolical Jerusalem. So the church is, in, the, the eastern part of the, of the church is in fact Jerusalem. Now if you stand here in, in Wadi Natsum, and you go south, you go to Ethiopia, and you go to the Egyptian oasis. Uh, if you go east, you come to Syria. If you go north, more or less, you go to Armenia. In other words, the, the, the themes are not, I think, uh, just chosen just like that, but they have to, do, they have to uh, be related to, to the the geographical direction. directions. And that also contributes to the idea that the church building itself is not just a building, but it also has a symbolical meaning of, of, of Jerusalem as the center of uh, of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Then, below the scenes of Akbar and Constantine, we have another unusual painting. <laughs> and that is the Domitian of the Virgin. Well, that as such is not uh, unusual. But what is probable is that this is one of the earliest representations of the Domitian of the Virgin. Because, as I told you, in the 8th century the theme did not exist yet. In, it was not represented yet in, in Christian art. Um, and here we have a 10th century uh, layer, the earliest uh, dated uh, example of the death of the Virgin that we know from the Balkan uh, is from the 11th century. Uh, so what we have here is probably something which is slightly older. And um, it also shows some details which you don't see in any other representation of the Virgin. What we'll see later in the museum is that she is usually lying on a bier on her deathbed, surrounded by the twelve apostles. Here she is surrounded by tw uh, six virgins, and that is also indicated in the Coptic inscriptions. Virgins. And these virgins are swinging censers. And what? Censers. Incense. Well, incensing is something in church which is done by the priests mostly. But a woman doesn't incense usually. It's 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 uh, uh, what a woman does do. What she can do is use an incenser by herself at, at, at home. But the representation of, of women who are incensing is it's 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 very rare. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I uh, when we discovered this, the scaffolding was here. And I said, look, women with censers. And I told some of the fathers who were here. I said, no, 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 that, that, that's impossible. Let me see. So immediately some of the monks climbed up the scaffolding to have a look for themselves and said, yes. No, 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 this is not right. Well, of course, the Syrians, yes, the Syrians. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we would never do that. Later on, uh, Johanna Nassim, uh, who also got interested in uh, the subject, uh, started looking about text concerning incensing and when the incensor was considered a consecrated liturgical object, and he came to the conclusion that in the 10th century, the censer is not yet a consecrated liturgical object which cannot be handled by women. So it is correct. In those days, it was not yet an official object reserved only for, uh, for priests and, and, and deacons. Well, he uh, wrote an article to, uh, uh, about it together in the Bulletin de la Société d'Archéologie Cop. So, uh, if you're interested to read all about the, the, the incense in women and the virgin, uh, it was published about two, no, three years ago. So in the Bulletin of three years ago, you can find the article. And there it's also uh, written how the six virgins who are here surrounding the deathbed of the Virgin Mary are the same virgins who accompanied her when she was presented into the temple as a young girl. So the same virgins are returning to her here, and the names and where they come from and so on, it's all written in this article if you are uh, interested. Mm -hmm. On the other side here, you see just a few men looking up, and this is what we discovered first, long before we discovered that part, and I didn't know what it was, until here, just below the inscription, the Syriac inscription of Constantine, there's a Coptic inscription which says Pisoma, the body of, and then a female uh, article. So, the body of, it should be the assumption of the body of the Virgin Mary. 
on the other side. So what we have here are uh, the two scenes uh, related to the end of her life, her death, and later on the assumption of her body into heaven. And then in the middle, and that's again a very touching scene in fact, we see the Virgin and Christ sitting on a throne together, so it's a double throne where they're sitting together, and Christ is holding the hand of his mother by the wrist, like this. So he's raising her hand in a sort of uh, gesture of triumph, and that's, that's, that's very interesting, as if he is welcoming her in heaven. And that's, that's uh, yeah, difficult to see from a distance, but what you should see, and that's, that's very touching, is this faint smile on the, the face of the Virgin. She has a sort of yeah, triumphant smile on her face, like, oh, here I am. Yeah, exactly. It's an <laughs> extremely beautiful painting. Yeah, good one, you. Extremely nice. Um, right, well, this is uh, what I wanted to tell you about the paintings here. So before moving to the nave, where I still have a few remarks, I can recommend you to have a look through the doors and to admire the stucco work in the... Uh, uh, the Hmm? Oh, the doors, yes, of course. Ah. I've completely forget. Look at your mind. Yes, the, the wooden doors here. Um, they have been finished uh, February. So it's just since a few months that they are visible in, in, in their present state. And I don't know if you've been here before, uh, but maybe some time before. If you look behind you, uh, you will remember that these doors were looking very much like those. That is, all kinds of pieces uh, missing. Mm -hmm. um, why did we interrupt the work on the wall paintings? That is because I realized that these doors were suffering very much from, uh, from visitors. Um, I have been photographing these doors every year. So every year when I come back, I photograph every panel in detail. And I was shocked to see that in the past four years, big pieces of ivory had gone missing simply because they were taken out by this door oh, wow. as baraka to be taken home. So, um, especially this door, these doors have suffered very much, as you can see. Um, then I ordered photographs from um, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, which were taken uh, in the 1920s by Hugh Evelyn White during his mission. And if you compare the, the, the pictures from 100 years ago, 90 years ago, with the situation now, you're even more shocked uh, about the, the difference and all the damage that has been inflicted. So what we did here, we started with these doors. Um, the monastery uh, had provided us with some ivory, and later on we were able to find more ivory. Uh, and in the course of about three months, the doors have been taken out completely. Some, some panels have been completely taken apart uh, because also their structure had suffered from, yeah, imagine they're a thousand years old and they are being opened and closed every day. So it's, it's no wonder that they, they, they were suffering. Um, so what has happened is that the, the structure has been uh, restored, uh, missing pieces in the wood have been uh, added uh, and all the missing ivory, except for the, uh, the figures up there has been uh, reconstructed. That, that's simply because here it's too difficult to, to, to make a complete reconstruction of all these uh, figures. The doors now also have their original color again. Um, in order to, uh, uh, to decide what kind of wood we could use, we had to analyze the wood first. That was one of the interesting uh, information. Uh, the wood which is used for the, uh, the frame of the door, so this part, it's cypress wood and the central panels which are slightly darker and also the thin lines which have been inlaid here are of a wood called paduk. Paduk is uh, a rare kind of wood which grows in Central Africa and in Asia, uh, which has to be imported specially, so also we had to find um, a wood importer who could provide us with uh, these woods to, to, to reconstruct the missing pieces. Um, but it shows that the, the people who, who made these doors have really done their best to choose exclusive materials. Ivory, tropical wood, uh, a very good quality of cypress wood for this, 
In other words, these were really uh, precious doors. And, um, well, they are still very precious in, in the sense that uh, they are unique. We, we, we don't find this kind of craftsmanship uh, anywhere else. Um, they are called the door of symbols. And the, the monks always tell that they contain 